He's reported on stories from all over the country and even outside the country. When the American Indian Movement had their first national gathering, he was there reporting on the sights and sounds. He gave inside information to native people and alerted them about bills in Congress that would affect Indian country for years to come with inside information from inside the beltway of Washington, D.C. He built his own radio talk show network that is still in existence today. And when we heard about the Indian movers and shakers, it was this man that told us. He now hosts his own radio talk show for his own people, the Muscogee Creek Nation. It's called Muscogee Radio, where he addresses the issues of the day that pertain to his tribe. He's a true pioneer for native media. And his name is Gary Fife. I got to sit down with Gary and discuss his life, his career, and where he goes from here. So please join me as we learn a little bit more about Mr. Gary Fife. It's Chase, don't go, Gary Fife, John Jeffries. Muskogee Radio, Welcome to our program. Uh, we uh, have a major change in our lineup today. We will be talking to some folks about that. Yeah. Well, if you've seen the movie The Outsiders, our neighborhood was pretty much like that. I grew up kind of on the north side of the tracks in Tulsa, not really a poverty-stricken area, but uh, weren't any fancy homes there, let me put it that way. And uh, the neighborhoods were, you know, fairly uh, middle class for the time, just after the Second World War. And a lot of people, uh, uh, military had come home and gotten jobs at various industries. My father, uh, Robert Fife, was working for American Airlines. And uh, he had us uh, a house over there in the Dawson area, which is, you know, kind of a tough little area if you've ever been through there. And, um, as we grew up, he decided he wanted to do a little better for us, so he moved us to uh, uh, an area north of Pine and Harvard, which was still pretty uh, middle class and easy going at the time. And that's pretty much where I grew up. I held only Indian kids in the area, but you know we got along just famously with everybody, with the neighbors. And that's, racing never, never came up. And that's kind of where I got my start through the Tulsa public school system and being uh, one of the uh, only Indians in the class, I usually got special attention during Thanksgiving with the feast thing and, you know, uh, history of Oklahoma, the land rush sort of, sorts of things. I had interest in uh, journalism and had wanted to get either on the news, uh, high school newspaper staff or the uh, yearbook staff, but those spots were pretty much filled by the popular kids for some reason. You know, like teachers will deny it and this kind of thing, but you know, you looked around and you see the same, you know, 20 kids doing all this stuff. So I just kind of blew it off and uh, looked at going to uh, Northeastern in Tahlequah. But when I got into Northeastern, uh, a lot of things were happening around the nation. And um, in 69, the uh, occupation of Alcatraz by Native people occurred. And it really uh, just caught the imagination of so many young Indian kids at the time, thinking, wow, you know, we're seeing the blacks marching for civil rights and even uh, Latinos, farm workers. And I uh, said, wow, where are the Indians? Just kind of wonder, wondering around in my mind. I thought, well, maybe we'll have to do it ourselves. And at the time, there was a, a kind of, well, let's call it a chapter of the uh, National Indian Youth Council in our area. And we're proposing some activist kinds of things. And I thought, yeah, that's not, not, a, not a bad way to go. We can, we can do something for our people. Uh, but I don't necessarily want to you know, be a, an extremist or anything like that. Let me see what I can do. And at the time, my uh, interest in journalism really reappeared, I guess, if you want to call it. And I got on the school newspaper and found out I really enjoyed doing it, you know, telling stories. About the uh, third year of my uh, 
curriculum at NSC, there came an opportunity through NIYC to go to Washington, D.C. and intern with a Indian Legislative Monitor magazine, the Indian Legal Information Development Service, ILEDS for short. And uh, we got, uh, I got, I got in there and I'd never lived in a big city like that. And, you know, young men get really uh, wrapped up in, you know, like, hey, you know, there's so much more going on here than there was in Tulsa, you know, or definitely Tahlequah. So, you know, I kind of like this. Uh, let's see what else we can do with it. And that was the time when some major pieces of legislation began moving through Congress. And uh, we were set up to look at every bill that went through Congress, I mean, every one of them, and see if it had some sort of implication for Native people, because we have the federal relationship, whereas uh, Mexican-Americans, uh, Chicanos was the term then, uh, African-Americans, and even Asian-Americans, none of them had that relationship with the federal government that we do through treaties. So it's... It's, it's never been a relation based on race. It's always been a political thing. A lot of people still to this day don't understand that, even here in Oklahoma. At the time, native journalism was, uh, I'd say, still in its infancy. There were still uh, publications coming out, like Wasselhoff from California and then uh, Akrasasani Notes from New York. Oh, yeah. And that's the first one I ever saw. But I was really uh, personally kind of dissatisfied with it because, you know, for all the good intentions and things they did and stuff they covered, it was a lot of rah, rah, go, go Indians and then let's go beat up on a white man kind of thing. And through my journalistic schooling, I thought, well, wait a minute now, there's another side to this story. And even though we don't want to hear it, we've got to know what the enemy is up to, so to speak. And so... Uh, I started uh, um, working, writing articles, you know, that did both sides of the story and things like that. Found it very satisfying. Um, a lot of people had uh, begun going through college. We had a generation going through college then who were more uh, interested in more worldly affairs rather than just what's going on on the res and what AIM or NIYC was doing you know, American Indian Movement. Mm -hmm. There was more to it, you know, because there were people fighting on a legal front. The social conditions that affected our people, you know, like, you know, of course, poverty, and then there was alcoholism and then loss of language and culture. So these are the stories that need to be told. And if there's a bad side to it, like uh, somebody sold somebody, you know, something out or somebody had their fingers in the till when they shouldn't have, well, then we have to own up to it and tell those kinds of stories. And, that pretty well set my philosophy uh, up until this very day on, mm -hmm. on uh, making sure our people got the, as much of the complete story as possible. And that kind of um, propelled me through, through 11 years in Washington, D.C., into um, uh, Z Communications in Minneapolis, which was first-person radio. And I discovered the power in electronic media you know, broadcast media, that, you know, what a radio show can have so much more impact on it. And it kind of appealed to me because so much of the time you hear people saying, well, our tradition and culture is passed down through the oral tradition. And I thought, well, radio is the perfect medium. Mm -hmm. I mean, we can hear the voices, we can hear how a, let's say a word is pronounced and how it might be used. Um, the intensity of someone's speech or the humanity, yeah. and so uh, I was convinced there that uh, I wanted to be a part of this world, and for the rest of my career I would be involved somehow. And so that's that kind of moved me through a first-person radio stage where I got hands-on, uh, first-hand um, experience with uh, with that medium. Then there was an opportunity to came up to move to Alaska and do the, the nation's first weekday radio news service. And moved to Alaska he did. With a desk, a phone, and a phone book, he built a national radio talk show network. But we'll talk more about that in segment two of Gary Five, Someone You Ought to Know. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you.